Hey travelers, quiet day in the mines today. Great day to have a little bit of a discussion talking about the differences between power consumption, heat output, and thermals or temperatures that your devices run at, like your GPUs and CPUs. Commonly misunderstood, a lot to talk about here. I got a little demo set up, the whole ordeal, so I would invite you and encourage you to sit down and have a little listen. Let's do a little chat. If you have any questions or comments or whatever, let me know below. I'll be in the comments to talk about it and maybe resolve your concerns. I think it'll help you get a lay of the land first. So here's a older but representative of a modern CPU. You know, I think we all know what these things look like. And a lot of people say, well, this is a CPU. Maybe, kind of. I think it's important to understand what makes this up so you could get a better idea of why temperatures could be higher or lower in some cases than you expect. So this here is actually copper, this shiny silver bit. They call this a heat spreader, right? It's made to spread heat. And it's actually nickel plated copper. It's just so that it doesn't corrode because copper corrodes quite readily. So it stays clean, they nickel plate it. And it's actually glued to this green bit here that isn't the CPU either, but it connects the CPU electrically to the motherboard, right? The CPU die, the actual functional element, which we'll talk about in a bit, is connected to this guy electrically and mechanically. And then there's a layer above it, the thermal interface material that pushes the heat into here. And then heat goes into here, into your other thermal interface material, your thermal paste or whatever, into your heat sink, out into the fins or whatever, however you want to take your heat out of your CPU, if you have liquid cooling or air cooling or whatever. We'll draw a little stack up of this so you get a better idea of what's going on. So if you cut this guy in half and you were to look at a side profile, this is what it would look like. Obviously not the scale. This is the actual bit that connects to your PCB, your motherboard. And on top of there is the die, as it's referred to. Nice handwriting, right? And that's made out of silicon, typically in pretty much every modern application. The wafer for silicon devices tends to look like this. It's made out of a round piece like this, just because it's easier to spin coat um, among other reasons, but these are hyper complex, insanely complicated. This is a very old design. It's just some logic or something, but um, it's not actually a CPU. Uh, inside here, in modern devices, every one of these squares will be a billion or a few billion tiny little switches or transistors. And these get cut up in little squares and glued onto the devices with little connection wires and stuff like that. This is the actual functional element. And in fact, on this wafer here, you can see it has some thickness, right? It's not like super thick or anything. It's pretty fragile, actually. But this functional element is only on the very topmost surface of this wafer. So this entire wafer here is just structural, right? It's just because they could only make it so thin. It's only so practical to cut it so thin and deal with it without a breaking because this is pretty fragile. But silicon isn't really very thermally conductive. So what they do is they try to make it as thin as possible. However, the actual functional elements are this itty bitty layer right down here. So this is the motherboard, right? All your stuff is happening there, but the heat comes out over here. So then you got your thermal paste, your thermal material, your solder on some modern chips. And then on top of that, you have your integrated heat spreader. Oh, that's good handwriting. And the heat goes through the entire silicon die into this thermal interface material, the solder or the solder paste. And that's the thing that older Intel CPUs tend to have a real problem with. This layer right here was bad. It wasn't particularly great at thermal conductivity. So the heat struggled to get through it into the IHS. And as a result, you could put the best heat sink in the world up top, right? And the heat didn't really get out of it that well because you gotta think about the entire system here. Right, the heat's made here on this tiny little bit, and this is a tiny little square. Inside here, the actual bit that makes the heat might be like this big, or some CPUs a little bigger, but it's not nearly this size. It's small, right? So all the heat comes out of this tiny little square, and then it needs to go through this some, this goo layer after going through the entire silicon wafer into this copper, and then another goo layer of thermal paste into your heat sink through the fins, out the fan, through the case, the whole thing, right? So it has a pretty complicated stack up. And like anything, if any one of these bits is bad for one reason or another, like if this die is thicker, it takes longer for the heat to get out. It's harder for the heat to get out. And then as a result, your temperatures here, where it actually matters, where you measure it, are higher. If this is bad, it means your temperatures are higher. If this is thicker, if it's worse connectivity, if it's warped and you get uneven contact, you get hotter temperatures. Of course, if your thermal paste on top is worse, hotter temperatures. 
Worse heat sink, higher temperatures inside your case, lower airspeed, lower airflow across the heat sink, higher temperatures, right? So all these things stack up and the result is high temperatures. And we'll give you a little another overview here of other applications and kind of sort of give you a big picture thing on how this applies to things like GPUs. Here's a really old SSD. See these little black packages? I think we're all pretty familiar with things like this. Inside here, another chopped up silicon wafer. And just another little square bits like this made out of silicon, right? That like that's pretty much the what all the modern electronics are made of, but we can't really deal with them that well natively. So we cut them up in little squares, we attach little wires to it, and we put them in little packages like this so that we could deal with it with automated machines. They're sturdy, they're durable. This just makes it more durable and harder to damage. Um, but inside here, sure enough, silicon wafer, and the heat needs to go through this plastic packaging and then radiate out. Now, obviously, these devices don't even have a heat sink on them, so they don't get that hot. They just kind of sort of dissipate their heat through the PCB and stuff, you know, these are pretty low power components, but some modern SSDs, things like the controller or things can get pretty warm and we heat sink them. Sometimes even the flash memory gets pretty warm. This is a really old one that's really slow. This is actually <laughs> embarrassingly to some extent compared to modern stuff, 16 gigabytes. Look at that. We have eight and eight NAND flash chips. These are one gigabyte each. <laughs> Modern SSDs are like tiny little squares and they can be one or two, three, four terabytes. They don't take up anywhere near the full volume. But anyways, that's just the march of technology. That's really just the difference in the silicon itself. Better designs, better lithography and etching processes to be able to make these devices so that they're smaller. Like you can't see this at all, the actual functional elements. Even with a microscope, with modern things, you can't see it. On an ultra modern process, like one of these little squares might be the size of a, a very high-end smartphone processor, and it would have 10 billion or more little itty bitty switches inside there. Crazy number, 10 billion, that's just, oof, that's a lot. Yeah, but that's sort of the issue. You have all these little devices packed into this tiny little area on the bottom of it, and heat needs to go through the entire layer, through goo, through more goo, and through all these other devices. So, of course, if any of these are an issue, if any of them are bad, you get higher temperatures. And part of the issue with high temperatures in things like modern CPUs is just simply due to the fact that modern CPUs are pushing so much harder than they used to. We used to see pretty low temperatures in devices like that because the reality is they weren't pushing the clocks, the voltages, the power through the chip that high. But modern ones, because of the competition between AMD and Intel, they're both competing to basically get the most out of the silicon. Because, oops, let's fix that. Because really the thing that costs the money is the design for this and then the manufacture of this physical wafer. And sometimes you get better ones, sometimes you get worse ones, and we'll probably talk about that in another video, and that's called binning, and they may sell it as a different model CPU. So it could be that a lower model CPU and a hotter model, higher model CPU are literally the exact same chip cut out of a silicon wafer. It's just one happened to come out a little bit better because it's sort of a hyper complicated process and there's some variability. And then they sell you the one that's a little bit better for a little bit more money. Makes sense, right? But um, anyways, in all these devices, there is these itty bitty little silicon things. All the heat, all the power comes out of a tiny little square area. And that's the trouble. So when you have this tiny little square making all the heat, if you put the power up a little bit, the heat goes way up because all these bits only conduct heat so well. All these different elements in this stack up only conduct heat so well. At some point, you get a somewhat non-linear effect. Power goes up double. It doesn't necessarily mean you get double the temperature. You could get more than that because at some point, one of these things is going to struggle to pull the heat away fast enough and the temperature shoots up. But that's sort of what we're seeing now. We're seeing people pump up the power as high as they can in modern CPU designs. Modern GPU designs also have aggressive boost behaviors. They'll, when they have thermal overhead, when it's cooler, they'll boost higher voltage, higher power. And that also tends to be more performance. And um, that's just to take advantage of the silicon, right? Because basically if the temperatures are low, if the voltages are low, the silicon's happy for the most part. And they know that they could get away with more power, more performance. Almost always higher power for the same device means higher performance. So usually what the end goal is to get the most performance, and a lot of times power doesn't really matter. Um, 
we'll have a follow-up video talking about the differences between power efficiency and how these things relate to modern electronics in a future follow-up video. That'll be an interesting one too. That's sort of another doozy. But I hope this gives you some vague understanding and impression of the hows and whys on modern things, right? It's just the stuff inside here that's actually making the heat is oftentimes very, very small. They put them in these larger packages to make it convenient to deal with. So high temperatures don't really mean that something in there is burning, scalding lava hot. It could just mean that there's a lot of resistance for the heat flow. It's hard for the heat to get out of through this plastic package. And that's the case with things like SSDs that maybe they have a controller that runs pretty hot and it's in a plastic package. Of course, there's other different kinds of packages, metal packages and things like this, but this is a very expensive package for a silicon device. So you don't really see like a package like this, this big with this big metal bit on top of it, the heat spreader. You don't see packages like this except in very high power, high end expensive parts because it doesn't make any sense. You don't need it on a little chip like this for memory because usually they don't really get that hot. You very rarely see much heat sinking on things like uh, actual memory for computers because, well, it doesn't really get that hot. Even that little stick heat spreader thing that they call it put on it, you don't even really need that. Cheap computers don't come with anything. It's just bare chips on a PCB. They don't really typically need much heat sinking. But very much depends on the device. And because of how itty bitty these little things are, if they push the silicon hard, if they're trying to get the most out of it and they don't worry about efficiency, then that's what you get. You get high temperatures. And I guess one other thing a lot of people tend to neglect, power in equals heat out every single time. One watt in is always one watt of heat out, every silicon device, right? So basically everything you buy is a nearly enough 100% efficient at heating. So if your primary goal is heating, you buy any electronic device. It's a 100% efficient heater. It's amazing, right? You buy a resistance heater, any type of space heater, they're 100% efficient heaters too. So I don't know, I think that's pretty cool, but it does mean that if you use resistance heat to heat your home or your space, then, well, you could just use a computer, you could use a miner, you could use a GPU, and it would cost you exactly the same for the same amount of heat. For some reason, people tend to get that a little confused. They think that somehow computers might take more power than the heat they put out, but nope, exactly the same. Um, but that's the issue. You put the power up into your CPU package, the heat it needs to dump out goes up. So you overclock your CPU, this itty bitty little square in there needs to suffer to get all this heat out of it fast. Because of course, if it takes longer, if it's slower for the heat to get out, the temperature goes up. That's just, that's how it works. For the same power, if the temperature goes up, it means that there's more resistance to heat, right? Um, how you cool these isn't necessarily just making them colder or something like that. It's just getting the heat out faster, being able to remove the heat easier, less struggling. It's the difference between putting a blanket over something and having it open or putting a fan on it. The fan doesn't lower the temperature. Maybe it'll help remove heat, which will lower the temperature, but the fan itself actually slightly increases the temperature. Um, yeah, it's just a complicated thing. That's sort of how heat works. There is no necessarily cold or hot. It's all relative. Heat is heat. Power is power. And turns out computers are perfectly efficient. 100% nearly. Anyways, hope this vaguely helps you. Maybe leave a comment if you have any further questions or a video suggestion for the future. But until next time, stay hashing.